Um, thank you everyone for coming to the first semester of the, uh, the seminar of the semester. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dieter. Um, I don't think he needs an introduction, and this is a kind of proof. So great to see you. Okay. He's really good friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, Dieter comes from uh, University of Washington. He does uh, excellent research, but um, that wasn't enough. So in a very trendy move, uh, what, like <laughs> a, a year and a half ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. he decided that he also wanted to lead a lab at NVIDIA, uh, focusing on robotics. And I presume that you're going to talk about that intersection today. Um, so let's see, Dieter is also a human being, so he doesn't only do research, he also has other things in his life. He's a huge soccer fan, that's the first thing that I learned from you. Just watching. <laughs> <laughs> but yesterday night in dinner, we learned that he's also a competitive uh, cyclist. Or oh, no. what is the right word, cyclist? Cyclist, yes, but competitive, I would yeah, say. Well, <laughs> he runs races to win. <laughs> I call that this competitive. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. It's an honor to have you here. So please. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me over, and thanks everybody for coming. I guess people can even move here on the other side and get a bit closer. Yeah, it's always exciting to, to be back. I think last time was about two years ago when I talked about a lot of stuff that we've been doing on the perception side. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about some work that um, we're doing toward robust manipulation, uh, which is a reasonably new uh, direction also for me moving forward. And um, as Robert already said, I'm currently spending 80% of my time at NVIDIA where I'm starting a new robotics lab. And how all of this came about was actually I met with um, Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA at CVPR 2017, and we talked about robotics. And um, my view is kind of that the, the, the real hot topics right now where you can see robots already being deployed in real applications or at least being close to be deployable in these applications, then it's a lot of this work that you can see you on this slide, which is robots that do delivery tasks in fulfillment centers, in hotels, um, in, in hospitals, um, of course, self-driving cars, which is a, a very big topic here as well. But um, if you look at this from a high-level perspective, it's really just about getting from A to B without crashing into something, uh, where your car or your robot right, wants to move around and it wants to make sure that it doesn't collide with other cars, people, or traffic lights and things like that. And um, this is already work that's happening, so it has already also large impact on, on industry. But of course, what's coming up is this next generation of robots that are physically interacting with the world. So rather than trying to avoid physical contact with the environment, there are all these robots that actually need to make contact with the environment to achieve their tasks. And this is this next generation of let's say robot manipulators that can perform tasks in open-ended environments, complex tasks, and doing so uh, next to people, which requires also very different reasoning because suddenly you have to possibly reason about um, touching a person rather than just staying away from that person. You have to be in very close contact with people. Um, there are many different, I think, exciting upcoming um, application domains, like uh, the next generation, what they call Industry 4.0, manipulators that are much more flexible rather than being pre-programmed, uh, manipulators that are safe to operate uh, next to people. And then we have application domains in future in the health sector, um, helping people lead an independent life, elderly people, people with physical disabilities. So we decided that that's actually a very um, interesting future, also market moving forward, but of course, it's still uh, much further away from being ready for a true deployment in open-ended environment, and there has to be a lot of basic research to be done in that area. And so we decided that we're gonna start a robotics lab in Seattle, and here's kind of what the lab looks like. On the lower left, you can see the building. We're on the top floor. Um, uh, upper left, you see kind of in the center, there's like a nice open workspace for our robots. So we have various manipulators in the lab. And um, 
Some key features are really that um, the lab is close to the University of Washington, so it's a 20 minute walk from the computer science uh, building so that we can have these close collaborations with um, also the students and faculty at the university. Um, you can also see, yeah, there's now a mobile manipulator there and various kinds of um, other industrial style manipulators. But on the middle left, this is the human kitchen. This is where the people eat, but then we also have a kitchen um, that is for the robots, which you can see here in the upper left image in the back, that's actually an IKEA kitchen that we bought. So the, the kind of work we wanna do in this lab is really basic research, so we're publishing it, uh, we're gonna open source most of the code we are writing and all the stuff that I'm describe, gonna describe, uh, we're planning on open sourcing and sharing it with the community so that hopefully others can, can use it and build on top of that. So that's actually a very important aspect of all this work. The flavor of the work we wanna do is really kind of what you might call integrated systems research, right? Where my sense is um, coming also of course from the experience from my own research lab is often that we're doing pretty small isolated projects because students of course they wanna write their, their paper and then when they get their paper accepted and then as a faculty advisor you come and say like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you would integrate that now into this bigger system or you would spend another three, four months on making this really work rather than just for the paper, then a fully understandable answer is typically, no, because I, I gotta do another paper, which means I have to do something that's very different. Because system building is often in the research community is not really appreciated, right? We just say, oh, it's the new idea that counts and just making something work is not really sufficient. Um, also what I think happens often is that um, the, the research areas are often pretty isolated from each other. So for example, people who are experts in computer vision, they do vision oriented work, but they don't often collaborate closely with the people who are doing more control work. So my hope is that in this lab, uh, we're putting together an interdisciplinary research team where we have experts from all these different areas and really bring them uh, together to work on these larger scale um, projects. Um, again, as I said, I, I think there hasn't been a lot of focus in the research community on building these kind of, let's call it complete manipulation system, right? It's often kind of small aspects of that that research groups are working on. Um, what that leads to is kind of that often it feels like we don't even know what the hard problems are if you want to get a robot to, to do longer term manipulation tasks because if you only do these small projects, then you don't know what is the real kind of failure case that you're gonna face in the real world. Um, also, there's not that much sharing actually going on on the, uh, let's say, software infrastructure uh, way. There's, of course, the, the ROS um, uh, direction, but uh, on the other hand, I feel like there is no manipulation system where you can just download the software stack and it just works on your robot. Um, I'm not gonna claim that we have it. Don't, don't worry, we're far away from that. But I think uh, at least this would be a goal to have a system that people can really share and, and build on each other. And if you look back at the, over the last years, if you look at the developments we've seen in um, deep learning, in perception, 3D modeling, depth cameras, and all of these, that there has been tremendous progress in all these small sub areas. And I think now hopefully the time is ripe that we can just bring these different areas together and make progress also on these integrated systems so that we can get robot platforms that actually can solve larger scale tasks. And that is kind of really where we would like to move. Okay, so um, now to, 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 to uh, put these different research areas together into larger scale systems, we chose a specific uh, test scenario. And in our case, it's actually a kitchen. Okay, so we said we're gonna, we just went down the road kind of and bought an Ikea kitchen that's in the lab. And the idea is that we really wanna use that kitchen to do a manipulation task for the robot. I think that kitchens are actually a great challenge scenario on the one hand side because you can make the task that a robot has to do in a kitchen as complicated as you want, right? You can start from something very, very simple, which is what I'm gonna to describe today, which is just about picking up an object and putting it in a drawer, 
just pick and place kind of tasks. You can initially say we'll only do this for known objects. You can then make it a bit more complicated by adding clutter to the scene, adding unknown objects to the scene, bring people into the kitchen, have the robots learn from the people, um, also interact with people, for example, maybe cooking something together, where initially you could say, well, the robot just has to hand ingredients to the person, but you could then go to a higher level, more complex task where the robot really has to anticipate what the person wants, help with the food preparation and things like that. So you can go from pretty, let's say, simple pick and place tasks all the way to a task that require accurate human robot interaction, activity recognition and all of that. So on the one hand side, I think that the kitchen can represent um, arbitrary tasks that you will also face in many application domains. If you want to put a robot, flexible manufacturing, many of these problems that are coming up in that domain you can also represent, for example, in a kitchen. Or if you want to have a robot that helps elderly people in the home, many of these tasks are also related to kind of the technical, at least, problems that are related to things that you can do in the kitchen. Um, so again, it represents a broad sense, uh, set of, ch of, of challenges and at the same time we can stage it so that we can at least get started. Okay. Um, of course this is not a new idea. There's been, um, despite my complaint early on where I said there's not enough integrated research going on, there's been quite some efforts on um, integrating more and larger scale manipulation systems. On the upper row you see a lot of work that's been going on actually in kitchens. The first one is at KIT, Tamim Asfur and Michael Bates uh, down in Bremen. It's done a lot of work on putting robots in the kitchen and moving objects around. Um, of course, here at MIT, Leslie and Tomas are doing some awesome work. It's not focused on the kitchen per se, but in very similar task kind of domains. And Daniela has done the, the cookie baking robot. Um, and also, for example, Ashdor Saxena has done some nice work on, on, for example, even cutting carrots, I think, in a kitchen and things like that. So there's been a lot of work already going on in kitchens, but I think despite all these efforts, there's still no system out there that people can use that kind of works robustly over longer periods of time. Okay, And then um, beyond kitchen, of course, there have been various of these kind of challenge scenarios where, for example, driven also by DARPA, or the RoboCup community, Amazon, where um, certain entities generate these challenges to um, push the research community to show their capabilities in the, in the context of a certain task. I think this is actually really, really good and, 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 and really help people. For example, here, Russ doing on, on the DARPA challenge or Alberto with the Amazon picking challenge. I think it really helps kind of bringing things together. The, the one limitation I feel is often with these challenges is that there's a huge focus on, first of all, there's this tight deadline, and on that deadline you either do it or not. There's a big focus on winning, and not necessarily always on just doing the, the most interesting research. And um, it's, not, it's typically not like a long-term effort, right? It's kind of this one challenge, and then, and then you move on. So I think what would be nice is to have kind of a, a longer-term vision for challenge environments and benchmark environments that the community can agree on so that they can compare their different uh, techniques. Um, so now in the kitchen, so again, we would like to put the robot in the kitchen and just do simple pick and place kind of tasks. So there's different levels or different kind of tasks that I think any, any kind of manipulation system has to address at least. Okay, so we have on the highest level task in motion planning where uh, typically the the idea is you have a certain, you have a 3D model of the environment, 3D models of objects as well, and then you try to come up with a, both a high level and a motion trajectory um, path or plan that um, achieves a certain reconfiguration, for example, of objects in that environment. And um, a, a lot of the work going on in this domain, also especially, of course, work by, by Leslie and Tomas, is really leveraging the idea of 3D geometric models of the objects. Um, often some of these techniques assume that you know the locations of objects. It's a lot of work uh, leveraging, of course, simulation to test their algorithms and also to, um, to, um, to benchmark them against others. Um, not so much learning at that level going on. I think typically the only way we're learning really comes in is in, for example, learning heuristics for these, for these kind of task planners. Um, I haven't at least seen 
uh, an end-to-end -end trained, really high-level task in motion planning that just comes through, let's say, a, a deep learning technique. Um, the next thing you need to do, rather than just planning like how to do these things in an environment, is of course state estimation and perception, which from a high level, it just means like, okay, the robot needs to figure out where the things are in the environment, right? It needs to know where the objects are. It um, needs to know whether a door or drawer in the, in the cabinets is open or closed. Um, at the same time, of course, we want to know where the robot in the environment is, the good old localization problem. And many of the techniques, even in that domain, also rely on, let's say, 3D geometric models um, of both the objects and the environment. And, um, and more recent work is building a lot on learning representations for specific tasks. Okay, so using uh, deep learning techniques to learn embedding spaces in which you can do reasoning. Uh, the limitation of these techniques is often that they are still kind of only working for very limited small set of tasks and aren't really broadly applicable. Um, object grasping and placement is then the question is, okay, now you have this object and you might know where it is. How do you determine how to pick it up? What is, what is a good grasp point? Um, there might be constraints due to what kind of gripper you have. There are other objects in the environment, so you have to do collision checking and all of that. Um, the traditional approach also in that domain has been on leveraging 3D geometric models of the objects, do a contact analysis, stability analysis, and things like that. And more recent work is, of course, also kind of learning to pick up unknown objects. Some very uh, interesting stuff. Also, I just saw this morning the work from, from Pete, which is really cool on learning kind of certain, to detect certain points of objects so that you can pick them up things like that. Um, and finally, once you know where the objects are and you have decided maybe how to pick it up, you still have the problem of the low-level control. How do you actually uh, control your manipulator or gripper to the desired location? And this has to be done, of course, in real time. Uh, it has to react to kind of changes in the environment and um, also uh, using constantly uh, real-time visual or perceptual feedback. So I believe if we want to do robust manipulation, of course, all of this has to be closed-loop control, like closing the loop with the visual feedback and the touch feedback as well. Um, so now the question is, we ask, like, if you want to build a general system that kind of encompasses various of these components at least, what kind of representation should we use? And um, again, there's a lot of interesting recent work on just learning these kind of representations. But we thought initially we'll make um, the assumption that we're actually using fully 3D geometric models of everything. And the reason for that is also um, not necessarily because I think this is the ultimate solution, but I think at this point, uh, 3D geometric models are the only things that all of these levels of tasks can kind of agree upon. Right, which means if they all know what to do, kind of if you have a 3D model of an environment, whereas if you do, let's say, for grasping, deep learning, then that doesn't mean that you have the solution based on which you can do task planning at the higher level. Okay? So we decided we are relying very heavily for now on uh, 3D models of everything. So here's our kitchen robot. This is, uh, again, in the IKEA kitchen. Um, for it to do anything useful, of course, it also has to be able to navigate. So for that, we use the platform that NVIDIA was already developing for the Isaac SDK. This is the Carter robot. And for lack of time, because we just moved into the lab in October, just more than four months ago, so um, we just took that platform and stuck the, the Panda robot on it. I do not believe that this is the ultimate solution for a mobile manipulator in the kitchen. You clearly want to have, I think, dual arm manipulation. And um, I think a Segway base is also not necessarily the right solution for a manipulation platform. But that's kind of what we had. OK? Um, we also, another caveat, we did not have time to put, actually, the camera on the platform itself. right? So what we're using for state estimation is two depth cameras that are kind of looking at the environment. You can see them there kind of hidden, hanging from the ceiling on the right picture. OK, so these are kind of the eyes of the robot. Um, I don't think this is actually much, hard, much easier than, for example, if you had them on the robot, because it's, uh, the, the viewpoint, they're pretty far away from objects and things like that. So um, all the algorithms we developed uh, are kind of independent of whether the camera would be on the robot or it's off the robot. OK, have that in mind. Um, yeah, and then the task, again, 
the, the simplest thing you can imagine, which means we have a 3D model of that kitchen, okay, even an articulated model, which means we know where the hinge points are of, of the door, of the drawers, uh, the doors and how the doors open and close. Um, we know 3D models, textured models of these objects, and um, there's not too much clutter. So all we want to do is pick up these objects and, for example, move them around. Okay? It sounds very, very easy, and me being a, a novice in manipulation, I thought, yeah, it's actually going to be easy, but it turns out it's not, still not that easy even making all these assumptions. Um, and uh, one thing to save the notion of 3D models, of course, is now you might say, how crazy is it that we assume we have these 3D models? But you could imagine that in the near future, if you buy your kitchen or so, it should just come with this 3D model, right? You, your robot doesn't have to build it, you just download it and there goes your robot. Or in this case, for instance, the 3D model that we have, if you buy the same kitchen, you should just be able to use it for your robot as well. Okay? But again, I, I fully admit that these are very strong assumptions, but we also wanted to see how far we can get with that. Is IKEA sponsoring the project? No. <laughs> are you selling kitchens? There we are. <laughs> that one, it's, it's on sale. You, you get an <laughs> NVIDIA discount or so. No, we take that. Yeah, so so I'm going to describe three components that we kind of focus on to put the system together. The one is uh, object post detection. Uh, we had done quite some work on that, where the idea is again you have 3D models of these objects, and if the robot wants to pick them up, then in this case we want to actually know the 6D location of these objects. 6D meaning 3D position and 3D orientation. And in that case, we actually also wanted to see how far can we get without depth cameras, because I think depth cameras are, are really good and really useful, and we use them a lot, as, as you will see. But they also have quite some limitations, right, with respect to, for example, the resolution isn't that high. For example, if objects are further away, they have a very limited field of view. So if you now want to use a depth camera on a mobile robot, then the field of view that the robot has is actually very, very limited. Um, Frame rate, uh, if you use normal cameras, you can have much higher frame rates. You can do global shutter cameras and all these kind of things. And of course, what's kind of counterintuitive, depth cameras have this minimum range, which means if you get too close, suddenly you don't have depth information about objects anymore. And then there are other kind of limitations. For example, if you have a piece of paper on the table, the depth camera is not going to help you detect that. Things like that. Okay, so we try to see can we do this if we have already 3D models of objects, can we do it without depth? Or how far can we get without depth? So again, the problem is you have the robot, it gets an, it takes an in image, and we want to know for a specific object in the image what its 3D location and orientation is in the camera frame of reference relative to the robot, let's say. Okay? So the, the main technique that we've been using is this technique called post CNN. And uh, in collaboration with the lab, we also did this technique that I think is being used here by, by different groups. It's called DOPE, where the idea is you train a deep network to take in an image and immediately more or less regress then to the 6D pose of an object. What um, post-CNN is doing here, you can see kind of maybe in the lower left image. So it, it takes an image and then um, labels the pixel so um, according to the mask which object is, is detected and also we regress to the center of the object. There's some half voting going on inside the network. And then once we detect this object in here, we can crop out the bounding box and then regress the, uh, learn to regress that bounding box to the 3D orientation. Okay, so we're decoupling position, which is in the image space, from the orientation, which is then regressed to. Um, the advantage of, of that technique was also that um, it can handle symmetric objects. It doesn't require texture objects, which you would need if you would just want to do something like sift matching or so. So it's, it's, it's pretty general. It, frame rate about 10 hertz right now, which is uh, fast enough for most of the purposes that we have. Okay? One of the key problems, of course, when uh, using any of these uh, deep learning techniques is how you train them, where do you get the training data from. And the, the painful way is you just generate a big, big data set, right? which means 
You have to go out and you put your object in the environment and then you observe it with your camera and then you have some labeling technique like also the one that's been developed here or something we did here where you then label the 60 posts and then you can use that data to train a network where the input is the image and the desired output is the 60 posts of the object. Okay. The problem is you need to collect quite some data to be robust to different lighting conditions and things like that. Um, and I think first presented by um, the team around Jonathan Trampley with the DOPE technique, what's in this call paper last year is that we can actually now train these systems fully in simulation using synthetic data only. And uh, we've been working a lot with the um, NVIDIA Isaac SDK team inside NVIDIA to improve on these um, synthetic data generation. I just want to show you briefly kind of what this looks like if you, how, what kind of variations you can introduce if you want to train an object detector. So first of all, you can take your object, you want to train your, on your GZ model. You can, of course, put it, put it now in different locations. Then uh, to make it a bit harder, you can randomize kind of the background so that your network doesn't overfit to that. Then you can also, of course, in the simulation, just programmatically change the lighting pos position, the position of lights, the color of lights. Um, and then also you can add, of course, other objects into the scene so that you can get occlusions and things like that. And again, the nice thing is you can just generate it all synthetically. And um, in this case, you can even, if you have a model of the kitchen, you can even put your objects into the kitchen. Okay, and then uh, again, the nice thing is for each of these images, you automatically know the 60 posts because of course, it's coming from the simulator, right? You can even put them into drawers and things like that uh, so that your network learns to detect objects when they are included and inside drawers and things like that. We are, it's still ongoing work to make it such that it's like truly robust, right? There are still some questions sometimes, how much domain randomization should you do? And uh, how much information about your target environment you want to introduce? So here you can see then how this works. We can just put objects into the environment or into any, an arbitrary environment. And then on the right side, you see the automatic labels we get from this. This, this actually doing this takes quite some effort, also software engineering wise from the team. Um, for example, you want to be able to run this headless in the cloud, so you don't want to depend on some uh, graphics display on which you can run this and all that stuff. So this is now also able to, to be trained on the cloud without um, requiring you rendering. And then you could put this into these different environments. Okay, so this is a 3D warehouse if you want to train it for warehouse or here in a hospital. Um, and doing this again, uh, we can now detect these objects in the real scene. Um, Post-CNN was kind of state of the art if you then combine it with ICP on different data sets. I just want to give you here one example of what this looks like. On the left, you see the RGB input. And on the right, you see overlaid the object models projected into the image according to the Post-CNN estimate. Okay, so on the one hand side. Can you give us a sense of magnitude, the order of magnitude of how many images are synthesized to Ooh, produce? Ooh, that's work? such a good question. Uh, many thousand. Okay. But again, because it's programmatically, it's actually not so, not so hard. Okay, but you can also see that these object models wobble quite a bit around still. So this is certainly not quite good enough for picking up objects. Um, and the, I think one of the limitations in general of all of these techniques is it's just really hard to regress from an image immediately to a 60 pose or something like that, right? If I would ask you, like in these images, what is the 60 pose of these objects, you couldn't tell me at all either, right? You wouldn't, because it's in this metric space, it's just really hard. But if you look at the images on the right, you can immediately say that something's wrong, right? It's not matching the image, and that leads to kind of another technique that, that we've been developing on top of that, okay? But again, this is kind of the, the quality we're getting from post-CNN in this environment. And I was hinting at, at this also, there's this performance gap of techniques that do post-estimation just using color, versus on the right, you see some state-of-the-art techniques um, doing this with color and depth. And obviously, depth helps, especially when it comes to uh, higher accuracy. And for picking up objects, we want to have higher accuracy. So um, we were thinking on how can we improve the color estimates using this intuition of um, 
that it's much easier to compare two images and say whether they match or not than regressing immediately to a 60 number. Okay? And um, that led to a technique that we call, um, and here this is kind of the gap we still see between these RGB only techniques and the RGBD. And that led to a technique, uh, deep iterative matching, deep, short deep IM. And um, it's, it's mostly just, I, I, I find it very intuitive and very simple, where the idea is, okay, we have a 3D model of an object, and we have an observed image down there, and let's assume we run something like post-CNN or DOB or any of these detection techniques to get an initial pose estimate. We can now take that pose estimate, feed it into the renderer along with our 3D model, and then we get a rendered image of what the object should look like in the scene or in the image. We can feed that now into a network, these two images, and the output of the network is a correction to the pose estimate. Okay, so it just says, okay, that image, that object should go further to the left or something like that. Okay, that gives us now an updated pose. We can use this new pose to re-render the object. So we're kind of leveraging the model-based knowledge about the geometry inside this iterative uh, technique. It's kind of, you could imagine, somewhat related to ICP or so, right, where you iteratively improve over time. We can re-render, we feed that again into the network, and the network hopefully is going to give us um, a de delta to that, a correction to that, so that it becomes more um, accurate. Okay, I hope the idea makes sense. Um, the important part is now how do you represent this um, post delta? Um, and we wanted to make this also kind of as intuitive for our little neural networks as possible, which means we didn't want the networks to have to reason about the focal length of the camera and all the underlying 3D geometry. So we wanted to find a representation for this delta pose between those two images that is kind of as closely related to the image space as possible, right? So that the network doesn't have to reason about all the underlying uh, 3D geometry. And um, the idea behind that is that we make it such that all these changes are kind of in the image space, like how would you move the object in the image plane, how would you do rotations, and instead of, for example, estimating the distance to an object, it estimates how much the object should grow or shrink in the image to match the other one. Let me just briefly highlight the idea behind that. So here you can see, for example, let's assume this is an object that we want to match against another object, and in this case, the rotation, the center of rotation, is put inside the center of the object, okay? So initially, what you might say is, I'm going to put the center of rotation into the center of the image, but then suddenly, your network would have to learn how to disentangle rotation and translation because they are coupled. In this representation, if you put the center into the detected object, then it's totally independent, right? It's just a local operation. The same, of course, also for uh, out-of-plane rotations. Um, the next thing is translation in the image. Rather than representing translation, asking the network to give us a delta in, let's say, centimeters in the metric space, the delta is just in pixel space. Okay? And that makes it independent, actually, of the scale of the object, how big the actual object is, and how far it is away. So the network just has to reason about, okay, it should move a little bit to the right. Okay? And then we are transferring that, of course, into the metric space using focal length and things like that from the camera but the network doesn't have to reason about that. And finally, for scale, again, or for the distance, rather than saying the object has to move backward by a certain amount, the network just says the object has to be resized by a certain relative scale. Okay? So, and it turns out that using this representation versus the more metric representations actually increases the robustness by quite a bit. Okay? Let me just show you some examples how this now works. This is on the occluded line mod data set. What you will see is in white is the outline of the correct outline. In red is the initial estimate. And in green, you see how the outline of the object changes through the iterations of the algorithm. Does it make sense? Visualization here? Okay. And of course, what you see, so the network is not doing contour matching or so. Right? The, what we are showing here is the contour of the 3D model. So the network is really doing the 6D pose estimation. Okay? So these are examples on, for example, line mod, where we train the network on these objects and we test them on the same objects. We've also done work on 
uh, here's a TLS, which is one of the data sets that's often used to evaluate um, um, textureless objects, symmetric objects, so it's working on that also pretty well. And finally, here we show, based on modelnet, that we can even learn to match objects that we haven't seen before, which means the input to the network is a 3D model with an initial guess of its position, and it can still match that against um, the observed scene without having seen the object before. And you get this only because we're doing these transformations all kind of in the image space, right? We don't require to know the size of the object even, okay? So and now if we look back at this performance gap between RGB only and RGBD, then DeepIM gets us actually pretty close now, okay? It's still not solved, but you can see that we're really getting closer. And also now we're looking at a version, of course, where we feed in depth. Here you can see another example. Again, the kitchen in the middle, you see the post-CNN, and on the right side, you can see what we get if we connect it to DeepIM, where you can see, of course, the estimates are much more stable. Okay, because it's doing this image-based matching. Uh, we can also, with the same techniques, of course, we can do tracking, where we just initialize the network with the previous frame. Here's one recent example that he generated. So it's actually pretty robust. So you can see, hopefully, you can distinguish the, the model that's projected into the scene from kind of the more faded background. And it's uh, pretty robust. You can see here also two occlusions. So this, is all, this specific aspect is also on ongoing work right now, right? But we're also looking into integrating depth here. Now the problem again with these techniques, they are still not quite accurate enough, so that's why we feed them into another layer, which is kind of the larger scale say, state estimation. And maybe some of you have heard of, of DART, which is this technique that we developed for matching depth camera data for tracking articulated object. This is work that my uh, student, um, Tanner Schmidt developed back at the UW, where the idea is we have articulated models of objects. These could be people, robot manipulators, or um, cabinets and things like that. And using depth camera data, we can now track these objects. And these could be, again, for example, a manipulator. And this is what we are building on here. But if you want to track a whole kitchen, then we had to extend that framework, right? But again, in the end, at every time step, what it does is it's just running an optimization that matches the depth data against your model, or the other way around, right? So that the, the, the discrepancy between the model and the observed point cloud is minimized. So now, if we want to use this in the kitchen, then we have to bring in different components, right? So the state that we're estimating is, we estimate where is the camera, we are estimating um, whether the cabinet doors are open or closed, whether the drawers are open or closed. We are trying to estimate the object poses, um, and also, of course, where the robot and the manipulator is in the kitchen. So all of these has to be jointly estimated through the start framework. Um, the depth camera data is used to estimate most of these parameters, but then also what DART can do, it can incorporate physical constraints about penetration of objects. In this case, actually, we don't have that in our current version. But what we're also doing is, for example, object detection. If post-CNN detects an object, then that can be integrated into the optimization of DART so that DART now estimates the object pose using the depth camera data. And the same also with the robot manipulator. If the base is moving, the navigation system is actually using a 2D laser-based map or a stereo map. And that information is then fed into DART to estimate where the manipulator is in the world. Okay, let me just give you an example here. So on the right-hand side, you will see the 3D model being tracked by DART. Um, the different colors of the point cloud is indicating what they are associated with. So that these, uh, these blue, yellow, white uh, objects, these are objects being tracked by DART. So you can see initially, actually, the manipulator is pretty wobbly here. Um, but it's initially only being tracked through the laser-based um, localization. At some point when it stops, when it stands there, then um, actually it gets locked into place pretty well. And then here we're tracking again, we're tracking, you can see it on the right side, we're tracking how that cabinet door is being opened. And we're using all these states then in the controller to know, for example, where the handle is that we have to pull on and things like that. 
and then it can use the object pose and in our case actually manually given provided grasp um, points can pick it up and move it around using exactly this kind of tracked state of the environment. Okay, so this in the, these situations actually works very well, but I also want to show you that it's not perfectly solved yet. So what you see here is in the middle is Dart, on the right side is post CNN I think. At some point you saw these objects kind of flying in, these were the ones that post CNN sent over to Dart, so Dart is now tracking these objects and it's working pretty well, but because the data association and things like that in Dart are just based on the depth data, at some point when objects get too close to each other or a person starts interacting with it, we should keep people out of robot kitchens, um, then uh, it's, if you know the system, it's pretty easy to actually mess it up. Okay, so we're working on that. I think one of the key limitations is again that Dart itself right now doesn't use color data, it's only using depth information. But you can imagine that the object detectors, they use color and segment out the objects. So what we're gonna do is of course, you can use these segmentations to help Dart make the right data associations. So that hopefully it will make the system much more robust. But you can see because Dart is just doing this local, local matching, right? You can get these objects to slide up your arm and things like that, okay? But again, if we don't make it too cluttered, then it's actually pretty robust already, okay? So now that we have an estimate of the state of the world, yeah, we, where the cabinets are, where the objects are, of course the key question is how are we gonna actually do the, the lower level control? And for that we're leveraging a lot of the, the work, these Riemannian motion policies that Nathan Ratliff has developed. So again, what we need to do is we need to send one kilohertz rate commands to, to the um, low level, lowest level controller of the, the Franca robot. Um, and in this case, these Riemannian motion policies, what they do is they let you specify control points in the workspace of the robot and um, it generates for these control points accelerations based on environmental constraints, for example, how close they are to certain obstacles in the environment. And um, the, these constraints are also done in a Riemannian metric that kind of warps the space around obstacles. So it's kind of like, I always feel like it's a bit like this gravitation of these uh, visualizations of relativity where you say that, that the mass is kind of deform, warp the space, and in this case also obstacles kind of warp the space so that they kind of move around these obstacles, okay? So these control points can be defined on the robot and again it generates these local policies for how these points should move and then it combines them all into a, a global acceleration on the controller level for the joint and not only in the 3D space, okay? Let me just, the idea here is for example, if you look at the image here, um, let's see on the right you can see Q is the, are the, the joints, is the joint space of the robot and then we define these control points X in the metric space here on the left, okay? These are points on the manipulator for instance and then for these points we can compute very quickly of course distances to obstacles and these distances get translated into how these control points would like to move, the accelerations. There could also be, of course, control points that are being pulled towards a goal, towards an obstacle or an object that you want to pick up. And then they are combined back to generate um, accelerations on the joints. And, and these motions that you're getting out of this, it's, it's a local technique, but it gives you, I think, very nice kind of a very highly reactive kind of motions in this space, okay? Here's another example, real robot. So here we're tracking the environment or the cabinet with Dart and that robot is programmed to hate open doors, I guess. <laughs> and this is actually Nathan there and you can see that it's actually very nicely and smoothly kind of moving around and quickly reacting. So when Nathan, for example, opens these doors, right, you should watch out for how it's actually pulling back in real time and doing all these motions. Okay, let me just give you now one example for how we integrate that into that controller over here, into the kitchen system. So for example, here's one example where the robot opens up a cabinet and then it wants to pick up the sugar box. I 
and then it puts it up there. And then afterwards, of course, it can close the door. In the interest of time, I'm not showing you that all the way to the end. But the idea is how this is working now with respect to these local goal points, because again, RMP is still a local technique. It's not something like RRTs. So it needs these guiding points. And we have a reactive uh, planner that provides these guiding points. Let's look at this again. So what we do is you see this blue point down there. So if we want that sugar box to go up in the cabinet, we define that point on the object. And these Riemannian motion policies now generate an acceleration, desired acceleration of this point toward the cabinet up there. Okay, so the idea is now that we're generating accelerations on the joints such that this point moves up. Okay, and conceptually, the robot, the manipulator, all the collision checking and everything is done automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. And once it's up there, then you say, well, I wanna have the backwards point of this object, I wanna have it inside the cabinet, and then you just put it in there. Okay, and you can see we had this discussion. This is where, for example, your work would just fit in straight away. Right? That would be really nice. Um, yeah, and to, to generate these intermediate points, we're not doing full task and motion planning, for example, like the work that, that Leslie and Tomas are doing here. We're just doing some high level, let's say, task level planning where we say uh, things like if you want to put the spam box into the drawer, the drawer has to be open and the spam box has to be inside the drawer. So it has preconditions, post conditions. And um, then we're generating a sequence of these higher level commands. And these commands then um, constantly check these preconditions in real time. And whenever one of them gets violated because something happens, then we go back and try to repair that. Okay, but. Um, this, this uh, reactive system mostly communicates with these Riemannian motion policies to provide these intermediate goal points. Here's now a demonstration of that the system is actually pretty robust to these disturbances. So the robot tries to open that cabinet. So in this case, it is covered that the robot was not really moving towards the handle, so it kind of backed up to one of these earlier control points. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, you should see it's beautiful. Yeah, no, lovely. I thought sort of seeing that. Oh, we should put a mirror over here, so yeah. <laughs> but it sounds like your uh, the the uh, post conditions basically define places where the dynamics change. So you're putting put, putting any hybrid dynamics through these post conditions. Can you learn the intermediate goal points through changes in the dynamics model? For instance, can you learn an intermediate goal that goes right through a contact relation or something like that? That would that's. That's an excellent question. If we can learn these intermediate points, for example, through changes in dynamics and things like that. We haven't done that, but that is exactly one of the directions we want to move into. How can you automatically provide these intermediate points and how can you learn where they should be placed? So right now, in this context, we are, we are modeling them by hand. But Nathan has a pretty nice interface where you just show it to the robot relative to, to the handles or, for example, to the cabinet doors, and it's pretty easy to program. But ultimately, clearly, you want to learn those, yes. Great point. Um, I hope you, you all saw the, the reactivity. I wasn't able to comment on that, but I think it's, it's, it's pretty neat. You can see that because we're doing everything closed loop, right, that even if the object is moving, that the manipulator kind of follows them and things like that. I'm going to skip that. Um, what I would like, so this was on, on the kitchen. Um, we are not quite at the level where, so, the, the plan is pretty soon we want to run some really long-term experiments, right? Where we say, okay, we run this for 24 hours. How many objects did we pick up? How often did we drop them? If we drop them, what happened? Did the system detect this? So the real goal here is to go beyond exactly what I just did, which means just show you some cool videos, but actually do some long-term uh, evaluations. Right? We just didn't have the time yet to do this, but this is clearly where we want to go. And the idea is also that we want to actually share, we want to open source the, the software here and share it with, with the community so that there are many people out there or many research groups out there that don't care about that low level stuff that we're doing here. Right? They want to do human robot interaction. And I think for them it could be super useful to have at least a reasonably robust uh, manipulation system that they can deploy. 
right? I think also that the assumptions we are making here or the system is designed such that uh, it can actually be deployed in a different environment um, pretty easily. What you need is 3D models of the objects. Let's say YCB, we already have these and you need to measure out your kitchen to get your 3D model. And then the hope would be to be, to be shown, of course, that any other lab can use this in their environment. But that is the, the, the ambition we have with this, okay? I just wanna show you some examples of some other stuff we're doing very, very quickly. Um, and, and, and then I'll wrap up and hopefully we have, yeah, a lot of time also for more discussions during the reception then. Um, oh, one thing, one actually big effort that I just said is uh, simulation. So I showed you some of the simulation work um, where we use simulation to train the object detectors. But um, there's a large scale effort, it's called the Isaac Sim team, where they're trying to build kind of really strong photorealistic, physically realistic simulation of these environments. And we worked with the Isaac Sim team to build a physics based realistic simulation of our kitchen. Okay. Um, it turns out it's a, it's a, a pretty significant effort. Um, and the idea is really we want to have a simulation such that we can run our complete um, manipulation stack, including the visual perception, depth information, the force control and everything in the simulator the same way we would do it in the real world. And I think um, what's, what's nice about this is on the one hand side, we can learn a lot about what it actually takes to do this, right? Since we have the same kitchen in the real world and in the simulator, we can see how realistic it really is. And at some point, maybe if we can show that the results in the simulator actually transfer to the real world, that means that a lot of the research could be done in such simulations, right? But this environment enables us to actually test that out, right? How close we really are. Um, so th again, this team built the simulator of that kitchen you can see here on the right side. So this is our system running against the simulator, which means it's really at the level of the robot of measuring the context, the robot has to move the handle, it has to exert forces to pull on the handle. It's giving us the right kind of feedback that we would get from the low level controller of the Franca robot. Um, in this case, um, we are not using the simulation of the color and depth. We are just feeding in, let's say, the dart result, but um, that's the next thing. You can see that actually the, the visualization is, is, is photorealistic, so which means we can actually, we have all the tools for streaming the camera viewpoint from any ca camera viewpoint that you would like to have and also the depth. We just haven't fully integrated it into our test system, right? But um, I think that's another advantage of having these simulators. First of all, you can test your system, right? Just kind of at the, at the, at the coding level, whether you're messing things up on your state machines or things like that. Um, also, what this can be useful for, for example, we are wondering where should we put the camera on the robot? Doing this in the physical world is not so easy and knowing where you should put it. So we can now actually do it in simulation because the simulation is good enough to tell us kind of what we would be missing given a certain location of that camera, okay? Um, again, this was a very significant effort to build this kitchen. And one of the, the designers, Johnny, Johnny Costello, when we had kind of a, a meeting with them discussing, okay, how did it work and, and how easy was it? He said, for me, that was harder than building a model of the Death Star for Star Wars or so. And the difference is, if you're building these super cool, let's say, Death Star style models, you can always go and say, oh, that wall, that doesn't look right. Let me just shift it a bit to the left. Right? Or you can just move things around, who cares? It just has to look good. But in this case, actually, the things have to behave the right way, the same way they behave in the real world. And if you get something, whatever, if your drawer is a little bit too wide, then suddenly it doesn't fit into the cabinet anymore and all these kind of things. So everything has to be consistent. But again, I think on the longer run, why shouldn't we be able to buy a kitchen from our favorite kitchen supplier and it should come with a 3D model? right? I don't see why that should not happen in the, in the near future. Um, another area we're looking at is an unknown objects, manipulation of these grasping. Uh, you've seen a lot of work, for example, also on, on, on DexNet, but here you can see on the left, we can, with the flex simulation, we can test many different grasp and simulation, all of course in parallel, using some nice NVIDIA GPUs. 
Um, and then you can get for these objects, you can just look at all the possible ways you can grab them. And um, this kind of data can be useful, first of all, in a real scene where you then choose which grasp to, to, to use to pick up an object. But you can also, of course, now feed that into deep learning techniques to learn grasp for unknown objects. And we, we're currently doing that. We're getting actually already very good results, where you just go from the point cloud to generating grasps for that, even if you have not seen that object enough, because we trained it in enough simulated objects. Okay? Another direction that, of course, I think is going to be really, really important is providing these robots with sense of touch. This is a KUKA robot uh, with an Allegro hand and a Syntouch. And here on the left, you can see that we're now looking at, okay, how can we pick up objects with that? Uh, in the middle, you can see this is kind of the tracked state of the system. And we're also using these RMPs in this case, these motion policies, to determine, for example, the fingers, how they should approach the object and things like that. So it's a very general framework. Um, also, uh, for touch sensing, of course, it's important to have good models for them. We did several intern projects last summer. Have some papers. Here's one from, from Bala, where uh, this just shows kind of going from the Syntouch sensor to an estimate of where the touch point is and which direction uh, the force goes. Okay, so this is an upcoming ICRA paper. So again, a lot of work goes into learning models of touch sensors, using them for control, and also hopefully uh, learning simulated simulation models, like for using finite element methods kind of for these touch sensors. I think this is a, a wide open field, and of course there's some really cool work going on here as well. Um, another interesting aspect is, I think, um, how can we train policies in simulation? This is also an upcoming ICRA paper with Yevgen when he did that as an intern with us, um, where this is this kind of peg on a rope in a hole. And the idea is we have a simulator. The simulator has physics parameters, and we don't know the real one. So what we do is we kind of train it in the simulation. Then we do some rollouts in the real world and use those to refine uh, the physics parameters and learn the right distributions for the randomization. Okay? There's some other work also with Fabio Ramos, who's now a, a full-time visiting faculty uh, with us, uh, where we're using Bayesian techniques for updating these simulation parameters. Okay? So again, the idea is just learning more robust techniques that can translate from simulation to the real world. And finally, we have also to new vision people who are looking at, for example, skeletal tracking, human pulse in estimation, and activity recognition. Because I think ultimately, if you want to have people in the lab, you obviously need to be able to track them. Uh, we want to also investigate how we can do tracking such that it's physically consistent with the environment and things like that. OK, so this is all ongoing work. Um, let me, me summarize. Um, so the goal really is we want to have uh, robust manipulation systems. Um, I think the observation is really that we've seen a lot of progress in individual components, such as detection, such as 3D modeling and cameras. And um, we really want to now build on these um, to build more robust, like full manipulation systems rather than small components only. So we really want to do this integration. Um, yeah, and, and what we want to hopefully get out of this is really that we learn what are the hard problems, right? Like, what does it take to get a robot like the one we have to just, let's say, get 95% um, robustness over, over a week or so, right? Like, really long-term experiments that we want to do. And also, we want to push this out to the community so that others can benefit from that. I think that's going to be important. I think uh, kitchen environments in general are um, very well suited to, be, to, to stand in as a challenge environment. Um, for many other domains, even be it industrial manipulation or helping people in the home and areas like that, um, we can make it as complicated as we want. Um, I would even suggest maybe using such kind of kitchen environments as a benchmarking environment. We are, we're still lacking good benchmarking environments for larger scale manipulation systems, right? There are these like the YCB data set or things like that, but I think it's often still too limiting. So if we could have multiple labs that all have, for example, a kitchen or so, and you say, if I, I want to show that my system is really good, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the other labs, kitchen or things like that, or if we can do this, a lot of this work in simulation, I think this would be really beneficial because we could really measure progress this way, right? It would also enable more of this sharing, um, sharing of, these, of these ideas. Um, I think 
To summarize also that this notion of this robust manipulation, at least under these constraints that we have, I think we're getting very, very close. Again, I haven't shown you any long-term experiments, but we're going to do these very soon. Um, and I think simulation is going to be, of course, uh, a, a very important tool moving forward uh, to train these systems and to also develop them. Um, I would like to briefly thank, of course, we, yeah, all, the, all the, the awesome researchers that are working with us in the lab. And also, we had a huge number of interns working with us already last summer. We're expecting a good set of them coming in this summer again. Um, we're collaborating with students here at the university locally. And of course, the huge teams at Inside NVIDIA that we're collaborating with both on, both on the simulation capabilities and on this um, robot navigation, this Isaac SDK uh, toolbox. And um, I'll just put this up, and people can this for um, discussion if we want. But this is kind of, we learned a lot by doing this. It's much harder than I thought. Um, but I think we made some progress. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Okay. talk about implicit versus, you know, an explicit representation that you know exactly what it means versus a lot of works, especially in the RL world, are using some implicit representation that it seems like it's very hard to connect to any other system, yeah. uh, like any other level of your stack. So can you talk about what you um, so the question was about these 6D explicit 3D model representations versus maybe more deep RL style learned implicit representations. And I think, um, I think on the long run, I don't believe we should or we do rely on these 60 poses and accurate models of everything. Obviously, we humans don't, don't do this. But so, so maybe the right answer is somewhere in between, where a lot of the work that we see in the deep reinforcement learning is that they do learn representations that are obviously well suited for solving the very specific task that they are looking at. But if we want to have robots that have general capabilities that can do, for example, manipulation tasks in any environment, right, without having to be retrained all the time, then I think we need to learn these kind of representations such that they provide the information that is necessary, right? So for example, even if you have, let's assume you have an implicit representation, a, a thousand dimensional space whatever it would be. That space needs to somehow encode something about the 3D structure of the model. It needs to encode something maybe even about the semantics, affordances, and all of that. And I haven't seen uh, yet, at least, the work that really solves this problem uh, sufficiently well. But I think these implicit representations is a super exciting way to go, and we're also looking at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh. You had a slide at the beginning with a ingredients of a basic manipulation mm. system, right? And you have like four bullets there, which all of them are like open research problems, very hard problems. Uh, Shall I bring it up? And I guess you're saying by forcing yourself to integrate them, you discover what are the hard things. The question is, is by forcing yourself to integrate them, are there other things within those that are actually simpler or less relevant or less important than the attention we give them by just working on them individually? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's actually an excellent point. So the question is, if by forcing us to integrate them, whether we're not missing out maybe some way of looking at these problems that doesn't require this full integration or that doesn't require um, like solving them in this generality. And yeah, for example, actually, I don't think it prevents us from learning that, but we can, we can also learn it through this. So for example, one notion that I had on this slide, one thing at least I learned is when this notion of having this DART framework that tries to estimate everything in the world at the same accuracy kind of, right? That just seems to be um, actually making the system more brittle than it has to be because if I want to pick up this object here, I don't care about the exact location of the door back here, right? But if I have a global framework that just estimates everything consistently, there's a risk that by trying to estimate that door position very accurately, I might actually be less accurate here. So there's a direction, for example, where you might say, rather than a globally 
consistent estimate, can we do something that's closer to something like focus of attention, right? Where I'm zooming in and out kind of in my representation and in how accurate I want to estimate things. So for example, if I want to pick up this object, I, I'm actually estimating the relative position of my finger and the object itself with, with very high precision, right? But um, typically I don't care about this kind of precision, right? So that is one of the things where we feel like, um, yeah, trying to do everything super accurately is, uh, is, I think, overkill for many of these problems. That could be one of these examples, I think. Yeah, Sunila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I just wonder, um, in terms of um, in terms of the precision you need, uh, right now the solutions you're looking at depend on the kind of robot you have picked and the kind of capabilities that robot has. And uh, there's the question of whether we should have soft hands, for instance, as a way of dealing with uncertainty. And um, so, what, what do you think is uh, the right way to think about? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Also related to which precision we require and whether we should think about different kinds of robots, for example, or soft hands and things like that. And um, on the on the one hand side, I hope that the system is designed that it should work with even le clearly less precise robot systems because it is doing most of the decision making, for example, on the controller side is kind of done in this relative space. So if you have a robot manipulator that's not as accurate, I think this should work as well. Um, I think looking into soft hands and other kind of uh, manipulation devices is clearly the right way also to go, right? For example, that gripper has very little kind of gives you very little leeway with respect to um, having noise or uncertainty in the pose. I think some of these soft hands might even be, at least for picking up, more forgiving. So you might not even need the same precision that we need for, for this kind of robot. That's one of the design uses. Yes. Yes. Of course, they might have not quite the, the flexibility with respect to how you pick up an object, right? Because they're, I think, often doing more power grasp style approaches. But um, I, I fully agree, like switching to these kind of hands. My hope would be that if someone says, OK, I have my robot with a very cool soft hand, that they could leverage, let's say, 80% of the system and just replace that component. And it should hopefully just work better even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that keeps them coming out. Oh, should we have cameras everywhere or RFID tags to label and tag all the objects in the world? Um, I, I honestly, I don't know. Maybe in the, near, in the far future, we will have this, but I think we'll have non-automated doors for quite a while in, in our environment. So, um, And I think actually that is kind of the almost the easiest problem, opening a door drawer. So um, I'm not sure if you can justify the cost versus the, the benefits you're getting out of that. And also with that respect, I just want to say, of course, right now we are opening these doors using leveraging, again, these accurate models and everything. Um, but we're also looking at, for example, if, if you go into a kitchen and you want to open a door, you don't have an exact 3D model of that thing in your mind, right? What you do is you say, oh, there's the handle. Let me pull on the handle. And we have then robust control for doing that. And I think, of course, robots should be able to do these kind of things as well. Oh, I think Russ has been, and, and then we can go, go back. A few years ago, we were talking to you. Uh, you said, I don't do manipulation yet. It's cool that you're doing it. But you said, you should just be able to learn everything. Mm. Isn't that the perfect case where? You wouldn't want to be motion planning. You'd want to be doing learning down here. It's, it's, it's just a, such a natural place to just get rid of all the details and, and trial and error. And I don't see that here yet. As you, as, I mean, well, a bit of, of uh, you yeah. know, grasps and everything. Yeah. But do you expect learning to come in and play a bigger role in the bottom end of your pipeline? So, so the way I would see this is kind of this is this means doing our homework, which means okay, we gotta let's let's see 
how under these assumptions and with these, let's say, strong model-based framework, how far we can get. And I think we're pretty close. And then we're really pushing already now in parallel, we're really pushing also the, the, the learning side forward, right? Be it about picking up unknown objects and, um, and not requiring these exact models anymore. So I think um, the interesting aspect will really be how we combine these two, right? It's, I don't think it's going to be just, let's assume we would have solved, tried to solve all these individual problems just with learning. I don't think we would be anywhere near where we are right now. And also we would not be anywhere near where we are right now with respect to the ability to just take that system and put it somewhere else. Because we're just not there yet on the learning perspective, right? I can clearly see that on the picking up unknown objects that you can now get very close to these capabilities through learning. But I think the overall system which we really wanted to enable here, I don't think we're there yet. Did I not change your experience about that? Or oh, that's a good point. Wait, what did I say? I said it's learning. Did I, did I say it's learning only? Okay, so. Yeah. No, that's a. It's a. I think. In in this case, it was also just because we felt detection, dart kind of tracking is really. It feels like it's really close we can really do this and we can understand it. Or for example, these Riemannian motion policies, they're really good if you have these models around them, right? So it seems like it enables all these different components that are individually or very close to actually solving some of these problems. Um, but again, having said that, I think ultimately moving forward, we can now go and we can approach these same problems using more deep learning controller learning and things like that. But it also keeps us honest because um, th there's a lot of deep learning work out there that is about opening a single door, let's say, right? And I think seeing then such a system will keep us honest in saying like, okay, opening a door is actually not the most exciting thing we can do in the world, right? So it gives us kind of, let's say, a model-based baseline. And I think the learning stuff we're doing should kind of be at least related or compared to such a baseline. Oh, no, no, I think we had, oh. I think we're going to take one more question. Um, we have nice food and drinks outside, and the hope is that we can continue the conversation sure. with food and drinks. So, <laughs> uh, just one more. Yeah, one more. What's going to be hard? Oh, if you introduce clutter. Oh, yeah, Ooh, sorry. Um, I think for the grasping, I mean, there's this continuum, right? Like for the grasping, if you go to complete clutter, then you go back to something that's almost, let's say, DexNet style, right? Where you just have your grasp point and pick something up that you can pick up. I think in the kitchen, actually, we don't have that kind of clutter. Ooh. It, <laughs> Yeah. Inside the cabinets, let's say, we might not have that kind of clutter. There. So it's more, it's still cluttered and dense environments, but they have, I think they're even more complex, right? Because it's not just about grabbing anything you grab, you, you can grab, but actually I want to grab that, that specific coffee mark or something because it's my favorite coffee mark, right? And the clutter still has to be taken into account. I think for known objects, I hope it might not be so super hard because let's assume for each object you have um, all possible grasp that you pre-computed through simulation or so, right? And then a lot of it is about, okay, now I take my clutter and collisions into account and I'm just gonna remove those that are not accessible anymore. And the hope would then be maybe some, some simple strategies that just grab the one in the front, get it out of the way and then pick others might already get you not 100%, but, but somewhere in that direction. Um, on the perception side, um, we've done with the post CNN stuff, for example, we've done actually pretty well with objects that are including each other, multiple objects in the scene. But if you think about kind of the, the, the crazy kitchen kind of thing, that is just still pretty far out. And I'm not going to give you a, a number, a multiplicator, but it's, but it's more than 1.5. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.